Okay, so what we're going to make now is a, um, a Middle Eastern style dip that we're going to use for our anti-busted bladder. So we have one whole eggplant here, we have some ground cumin, a little bit of tahini, which is a blended sesame seed paste, some nice smoked paprika, a little bit of parsley, you can use Italian or curly, salt, pepper, lemon juice, a little bit of olive oil. So they're our key ingredients. What we really need to focus on here is to, to get our eggplant onto the straight over the flame and we're after a really, really nice charred, charred flavor. So we're looking at a low to medium heat. We're gonna cook this long and slow over the, over the flame and you'll see that it's going to start flaking, it's gonna start peeling, that's okay, that's what we want. We do want a nice, beautiful, smoky flavor. So this process might take about 15 minutes. We come back, we keep turning it. Um, depending on the size of your eggplant is how long it'll take. But what we're after is a really, really soft eggplant that's quite charred on the outside. And then we're gonna place it into a food processor to blend, uh, but we'll show you through that after, after the eggplant's cooked. So at home, Rowan, if they have an induction cooker, What's an alternative method that you could do to cook this? Uh, they could easily go, go outside if they've got a barbecue. If you've got a barbecue available, beautiful place, probably the best place to do it actually, rather than uh, dirty your stove top. Or you could uh, prick it with a fork a couple of times, wrap it up with a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper into uh, in foil, and pop it in your oven at a, at a nice hot temperature, 180 to 190 degrees to cook through. All right, so the eggplant's been been turned and turned for probably the last 15 minutes, getting nice charred. You see that it's nice and soft. You'll be able to feel it up, up around the top here. If it's nice and soft there, you know it's ready to, to take it off. So I've just put it in a I've just put it in a bowl with a colander here. I'm just going to allow it to cool slightly, and then you can start peeling it. So you can put it onto your chopping board, or you can do it over by the sink. You just need to start peeling it away. This is still a little bit hot for me. So I'm going to allow it to cool a little bit more before I peel away all the skin. So, so I've just allowed the, the eggplant to cool. I'm taking all the skin off here. You can use a small knife if, if need be. It's okay to leave a tiny little bit of the skin on. It actually adds a nice smoky charred flavour to it. And then you can just break it off just like that. Discard all of the out all the skin. We can go straight over to a blender. You can chop this at home as well. Finally chop it on the on the board if you don't have a food processor. I've got two cloves of garlic, so about 20 grams of garlic there. It's important to put that in at the start as well. So I want a nice fine I want a nice fine paste here. So I'm gonna puree this at quite a high speed and then I'll start to think about the other ingredients. So I'll start off slow. So I'm gonna add my parsley also now. I want the green colour to go through the... Wait for that to be finely chopped. And then all my other ingredients can go in here except for the oil. I'm going to use the oil to try and emulsify the, the dip. So I've got my ground cumin, smoked paprika, my tahini, which we spoke about earlier, is the, the blended sesame paste. Nice generous squeeze of lemon. And a little bit of salt. pepper as well. Once that's incorporated, I'm just going to slowly add my olive oil.
I'm just going to have a taste here to see that we've got the correct amount of seasoning. Mmm, tastes beautiful. And place it into a small bowl, allow it to cool completely. Until we're ready to assemble the antipasto platter. But you can, as I said, you can chop this also. Finally chop it if you don't have a food processor. So that's what we're looking for with our baba ganoush. So here's another dish for our antipasto platter, mushrooms a la grec. So we're basically cooking the, uh, the mushrooms in a little bit of oil, some lemon juice and some different aromats. So first of all, what we'll do is we'll get the, our olive oil and our lemon juice into a pot. along with some coriander seeds, bay leaves, and some lemon thyme, which is beautiful floral smelling herb. And we're just gonna put that on a very low heat here, just to infuse gently. In the meantime, we've got some mushrooms here. Depending on the quality and the, uh, the style of your mushrooms, you may need to peel them back. So we've just peeled it back with the uh, tip of a small knife, ready for, ready for cooking in our liquor here. So we've got celery here, which I'm going to show you how to peel because later on in the antipasto lesson, we're also going to be peeling celery for our crudités. So we just get your peeler, peel along the outside. This can be a little bit tough and a little bit stringy sometimes. Okay, this has already been washed. I have some, have some water here. We can wash it a second time. And we're looking for something about 30 mils in length. So just use the first piece as a, as a guide for your remaining pieces. So we're going to cut those into, into three. And these will cook at about the same time as our mushrooms. I'm just going to leave that in here to soak. We also have some fennel, fennel here as well, which will add a beautiful aniseed flavour. We can reserve our, our tips here. We can use that for soups or stocks or sauces. And when you get your pack for home, you're gonna get a quarter of a, of a fennel bulb. So this one will save. Take the hard stalk out of the inside here. And give this a wash, making sure you're getting in between all the layers here. You can hear that that's starting to infuse. Just taking out a little bit more of the root there. We're cutting these similar size, about 30 mils in length, similar to what we had for the celery. Give them another quick wash. We have our batons of fennel and celery here. They can be added in with our mushrooms. So once your liquid's up to the boil here, we can add our mushrooms and our mushrooms, our celery and our fennel. We can gently cook those until they're tender. Here we're going to make a cartouche to put on top of our mushrooms just to help the, the steam stay inside the pot here and help that moisture come out of the, the mushrooms to aid with cooking of all the vegetables. So just make a, a piece of grease food parchment paper, fold it over once in half and always fold over onto the other sealed edge. So we've got two sealed edges there and now we're bringing four sealed edges over there. Always keep the sealed edges coming together. Sealed edge to sealed edge. So Rohan, we're basically braising these mushrooms, aren't we? We are, so we're 
going to have about half the half the amount of liquor up to the to the product, so about halfway up, and we're just going to gently steam and braise them uh, for another seven eight minutes. So we just need to put the cartouche into the middle, make a small tear there. So the cartouche, that acts as a bit of a sealing, doesn't it? Yeah, it's going to keep all the vapors in there. So all the steam that's coming out of the, the product is going to hit the hit the cartouche and go back down into the product. So it so keeps all that moisture in there. I'm not sure whether you can see there. Yeah. But that's but basically the mushrooms are going to cook in the own, their own juices that were released as they, over a period of time, basically, isn't it? So it's just going to... I'll turn the heat, heat down to a really low, low temperature there and just let them cook slowly. Shaking the pan, you won't need to take the cartouche off, but shaking the pan from time to time to keep it moving. So we're just looking at our mushrooms alla grecia. They've been simmering over the lowest heat for about six to eight minutes. You can see a lot of the moisture's come out of the mushrooms, they're now tender. The fennel, the celery, they're all tender. So as this is going to be served cold, we're going to put it in a bowl, put it in a flat tray, place it in the fridge, and keep it until it's cold. So we have here a, another dish for our antipasto. So it's red capsicums in olive oil and red wine vinegar. Just cut them through, cut them through the centre, and then we're going to cut them in. Another four. So out of each capsicum, we'll get about eight halves. So these have already been washed and dried. So is this the quantity the kids are going to get in their packs, Ron? No, they'll, actually, they'll, they'll get two capsicums. I think that's more than enough for us to put an antipasto together. So one to two capsicums, depending on the size. So why are they cooked in oil as well, Rowan? Uh, they're cooked in oil to give them a little bit of color, to help them soften, and also to help preserve them a little bit. So these can be prepared ahead of time and they can keep to, for up to a week if they're covered in oil in the fridge. So it's a very Mediterranean way of cooking and preserving vegetables, often seen in um, supermarkets nowadays with olives, mushrooms, even things like cheese, better cheese is marinated as well in oil. Yeah, these capsicums could also be prepared in, in a similar fashion to how we did the baba ganoush. They could be roasted over the flame, allowed to cool, peel, and then you could preserve them in a liquor with the, with the oil and vinegar. You could also roast the capsicums in the oven. There's many different preparations. So removing some of the membrane, some of the seeds. Okay, they're all prepared. We're now going to heat a pan, reasonably large fry pan. So if they haven't got a pan at home this big enough, they're just doing batches, don't they, Ron? You can do it in batches, or you could do it in a small pot in batches, depending on what you have. So I'm going to add about half the amount of olive oil that we have in the recipe. You can see when the oil goes into the pan there that it's already quite hot because the oil spreads very quickly, becomes a lot thinner. Make sure your capsicums are dry from where you wash them, otherwise it will splash at you. Medium high heat. We're just going to cook those, stir in them for about three to four minutes. We'll add a little bit more oil, some vinegar, some salt and pepper towards the end of the cooking process. So our capsicums have been over a medium heat for about the last six minutes. Just stirring them constantly, trying to get a nice colour on, on each side and softening them up a little bit. Now we're ready to turn off the heat, add some more oil. You don't want to add too much oil at the start of the cooking or else it'll splash all over your stove and make a mess. So you can add the oil, you can add a little bit of vinegar as it cools a little bit. So just importantly the heat turned off now. 
a little bit of pepper, some sea salt. I'm going to leave those in the fridge to cool down. So the preparation that we're having here is just some uh, sliced vegetables, crudités, so larger than, larger than batten. They're going to accompany our antipasto platter, can be used for the dips, can be used to, um, used to dip into the, our, our dipping sauces or our dips that we have. So we're just going to cut around in leaving the, leaving the seeds out of it. You want to have a nice firm Crudite, so we're looking probably about 60, 60 mils long. They need to be reasonably firm so it can hold a little bit of dip. So we have cucumber, we have carrot, we have some of the fennel. We've washed and prepared as we did in the previous, previous dish with our mushrooms a la grec. And we have some celery also that we've peeled and washed. So we cut these all into similar lengths. So with your carrot, just take a small amount off the edge there. Got a nice flat surface to work from. And this carrot we have here, I'm cutting into about threes. And then our fennel. You'll see when you're preparing the fennel that it's a little bit misshapen. So you may need to cut it separately to get nice even crudités. We'll reserve those for when we're plattering our antipasto platter. So we're going to finish off, we've plated our antipasto platter now. So we've got all the all the components that we prepared earlier, the mushrooms, mushroom de la grec, our crudités, we've put a little bit of grilled bread on there. Uh, we've got our tomatoes that we oven dried, slow roasted and oven dried, our baba ganoush with a little bit of extra olive oil and we've got our uh, red capsicums that we cooked in the red wine vinegar and oil. So it's important to remember when, you, when you're plating this at home, try and find as many containers of similar size that you, you can and present it in an attractive way ready for someone to to eat. So They could use a, a chopping wooden chopping board couldn't they Rohan? They could. Whatever, whatever you've got at home, we know you're cooking from home, so you may be limited with the selection that you have. Try and make it as presentable as possible and, and make sure you take plenty of photos for us so we can, we can have a look at what you've prepared. So this is another antipasto product. We've got some tomatoes that have been uh, blanched, just as we did earlier in our preparations for our tomato salad. We've taken the skin off. Now we're just going to cut them in quarters, remove the inner seeds here, and we'll be left with some, some tomato leaves. So turn them upside down to drain a little bit of the moisture. We're going to use these both for antipasto platter, and as it's the same lesson as our roast tomato tarts, we'll use it later in our roast tomato and onion tarts. So we're going to show you two different preparation techniques and how these can be used. So all your All your seeds and your juice can be reserved and used for another product. So Rohan, why are we slow roasting these? What does slow roasting do to the product? Slow roasting intensifies the flavour, so it dries the product out, but it increases the, the flavour considerably. So we're going to have a small amount of moisture loss, but the sugars and the flavours inside the tomato are going to become a lot more intense. So we're going to cook these about 130 degrees until they're nice and dry and have increased in flavour. 
If you don't have a, a tray and a, a rack like this at home, you can also put them on some uh, parchment paper or grease proof, grease proof paper and slow roast them that way. Obviously the, the rack is preferable, as it gives you good airflow, give, gives you good air circulation, helps the product get nice and dry. Turn all these upside down, drain a little bit, just give them a little bit of space in between one another. Brush with a little bit of oil. Load up your brush. A little bit of sea salt. Some cracked pepper. small amount of fresh oregano that we'll sprinkle on top. So we're now going to put these in the oven for about 40 minutes and about 130 degrees. Here we're making the roasted tomato and olive tarts. This is the roasted tomato that you had earlier for your antipasto. Uh, so reserve that in, in this lesson and keep it for these tarts. We've got some short crust pastry sheets. So just take your, take your sheets out. Make sure they're still uh, a little bit firm from the fridge. It'll make it easier for you to cut. And then just use your molds that will be provided to you. We'll send some of these back to you in your packs um, and use a knife to cut around the, the outside. So just go a little bit larger than the than the ring that will allow you a little bit of room for the lining of the, of the mold. So good luck for both of, your, both of your shells. You should be able to get four out of here. So in the event that you, you need to make an extra couple of shells, you can do that with this pastry. So you just turn them upside down. We're doing two larger ones. You could do smaller individual ones. Also, we're doing this because you're preparing this at home and you're not going to have a lot of, a lot of equipment, I presume, to bake. So this pastry is actually a little bit soft. I'm just going to put this in and then I'll play around with the the edge making it a little bit nicer when it comes out of the fridge. I just want to rest that for about 10 minutes. When it gets to baking these, we're going to bake them because they're not being blind baked. They've been cooked straight in the oven with the with the royale in it, so the egg custard. We're going to put them onto a onto a rack like this to bake, but you can put them straight into your oven rack when you when you do it at your house. All right, they're going to go back into the fridge to rest. We're preparing the caramelised onions for our tart. We've got some peeled brown onions there that have been sliced as thinly as possible. Ensure you take out the root uh, of the onions so you get nice even, even slices. We have a little bit of butter in a small saucepan. That's up to a high heat. We're going to add the onions. Stir them through with the butter and keep cooking them over a medium-high heat until they start caramelizing. 
as they start to colour a little bit, you can put a little pinch of salt in there. That'll bring out some of the moisture and help sweeten up the sweeten up the juice coming out of the onion. Towards the end of the cooking process, when we've got a nice bit of colour, we're going to add some balsamic vinegar and continue to cook for a couple of minutes. They're going to be one component to our tarts. So this is a to... nice low and slow cook for the best part of 10 minutes at least, isn't it, Ryan? Yeah, it's going to take a little while. As you can see, there's no, no colouring happening yet, and they've been in for about 40 seconds already, so continue to cook them 10 minutes, 12 minutes until they're, until they're nice and golden. All right, so they've been cooking away gently for about 8 minutes over a medium heat. Please pay a bit of attention to them, don't forget about them, come and stir them. Once you've started to get that colouring, you're going to add some balsamic vinegar to them. Just cook off that vinegar a little bit. And add a little bit more salt to them. Just allow them to cool fully before we start assembling the tarts. The pastry just come out of the fridge, so it's firmed up a little bit. Because we're not working with the proper flan tin, we're working with disposable containers, we're just going to crimp around the edge. So you can do that by pinching your thumb and your index finger and your other index finger here and working all the way around to give a nice crimp border. Normally if you're working with a flan tin, you can get a nice even edge all the way around your flan tin, but we're working with disposable so it's a little bit harder to achieve that. Alright, so we've got our pastry there. We can add a little bit of our tomato that's been diced up. We have it as leaves before for the antipasto. That can be diced. Spread that evenly on the base of the tart. We want plenty of filling in here. Now some of our olives, make sure they're evenly spaced all throughout the top. And finally some of our onions. We're going to make our royale mix here, so we have some, some cream, two eggs, Just beat them, mix them in very well. So why is it called a royale? A royale? Yes. Uh, because, of the, because of the rich flavour that you get from the cream and the, and the eggs. It's basically a raw custard, isn't it? That's the difference from having a custard as opposed to royale, so it's cooked from raw and not thickened, is that correct? So we've got our eggs and our cream here. I'm going to add a little bit of ground pepper. A little bit more. A little bit of salt. And then we're going to pour this into our tart shells. So we're going to cook it straight on the rack in the in the oven. I'm just going to pour a little bit in here. 
remainder I'm going to put in a jug and I'll fill them in the oven to make sure I can fill them all the way up to the top. So do this at home, you fill it when it's in the oven, but in this instance... I just want to show you how to fill them. I'm going to top them up a little bit. I'm going to move them down to the oven, straight onto the rack, yeah. and we're going to top them all the way up to the edge. You won't be able to see it from down here, but I have the remainder. You want them the... very full. You may not use all the royale, but they should come right to the top. Okay, so this is this is insufficient amount. We need to top them up a little bit, but I want to do that in the oven. So I'm just going to move them down here, bring my rack out a little bit, and they're going straight onto the rack. You can do the same at home. This will help cook the pastry through. Just a little bit more. All the way up. Close it up and cook them through 160 degrees. So 160 for It'll be quite a while, take a little bit longer than your standard tart. So the reason for the lower temperature is basically get that base cooked the same time as the Royal. Okay, so we're gonna check our tarts here. So you see that they've come up, they've raised up a little bit and they're firm to the touch. There's no there's no soft part in the middle. And let's just turn them out and see whether it's nice and golden underneath. We've got an even crust colouring there. If you were to find it was a little bit undercooked there, you could turn them out, put it on a tray and back in the oven for five or ten minutes to get it nice and golden. So I'm going to put one on the serving platter here, but the other one I'll cut open so we can have a look. Probably better to let them cool just a little bit more before you cut them. We're just opening it up so you can see the amount of filling inside. So you should have a nice amount of custard in there, good amount of filling. And that's our roast tomato and all the tarts.